to start the meeting so we can get going. Um, uh, yeah, yeah. Tonight's meeting, just so you all are aware, we, we didn't plan a very formal agenda. Most of our folks that report to us monthly told us that they couldn't be here tonight just because we're so close to the Christmas holiday and folks are out of town. So what we plan to do tonight is for the elected officials that could be here, we'll let them present. We have one proposal to talk about. Uh, it's related to a, a monopole on the kind of western edge of the neighborhood. Brian will be representing, I think it's Verizon uh, tonight. And then uh, I figured the community council board could report back on some of the projects we've had going on. Uh, and then we'll end early tonight. Uh, with that, Andrew, I'm wondering if you would uh, like to go first for now. Yeah, if you'd like me to. Yes. Um, we have had our, our last formal meeting for the year, so I think our next meeting is January 5th or the 12th, I can't recall. Um, we, we did a couple things. So on Friday, last Friday, we had a, a special formal meeting of the council to, um, uh, to do a temporary land ordinance for the overflow um, um, resource center, basically, on North Temple. Um, <clears throat> there's, some, there's a lot of background to that. I, I did a statement during that meeting about some of it and uh, some frustrations I have. Uh, most of you, if not all of you know that I work for Volunteers of America. I've been doing homeless and addiction work for a number of years. And um, the, the process for this started actually pretty soon after we ended the Sugar House one last year in April. Uh, meetings about next year, this, come, this winter essentially. And um, there are a lot of discussions internally with the Salt Lake Valley Coalition and Homelessness uh, about what was needed. They evaluated a lot of options, including sanctioned campgrounds, um, all sorts of things like that. And COVID sort of got in the middle of some of that discussion as well. And uh, they presented it. Um, they've been in talks with the city for a long time, most of the year with the county, uh, and then also presented to multiple other um, cities in the county, uh, both formally through the Council of Governments, which I'm a part of, and also um, informally with some other folks. Um, what really came out of that whole, well, I guess it was probably about eight months, six, seven or eight months of those efforts, was nobody would take it. Nobody would, uh, would volunteer, would say, we'll work with you on it. Um, Mill Creek was the exception when they were present, they have a vacant building in their city that's owned by First Step House, a treatment program that was, they weren't using it. And so Mill Creek said, yeah, go ahead, we'll, we'll make some, uh, some changes in our zoning for you. And they did. Um, Midvale, you know, was approached um, because one of the motel owners near I-15 in Midvale um, that has a vacant property essentially at this point, because a lot of motels have been hit pretty hard with COVID. Um, the word went out to the community and say, look, we're looking for any options, guys, from the private sector, from the public, anybody. And uh, we had a few motel owners who, who said, yeah, I have a vacant property. I'm willing to work with you on it. Let's do it. Uh, Midville had one of those and they had some discussions with the city there initially, which looked promising. And then uh, kind of suddenly the mayor and Midville said no. And the, the council, I'm not sure how much the city council Midville was involved in that. Uh, but they said it was against their zoning and they weren't going to do anything with it. So that killed that option. And uh, essentially what was left were uh, two options in Salt Lake. Uh, the better of the two, the better of two bad options, I guess, uh, was the airport in where the owner again approached the coalition and said, I've got a vacant property during COVID. I was going to renovate it, but um, we can talk and see if it could be useful for you all. And so that's how that came about. Um, I was opposed to it because uh, everything shouldn't be west of I-15 in Salt Lake City. Uh, seven of the 10 options for homeless services are in Salt Lake. All of them are essentially uh, State Street and West. And the alternative was we don't have another alternative. Um, and we were going into January at this point. And it's been a fairly mild winter so far, but uh, there was another option available. And so uh, James Rogers and I both talked. It's in his district technically and um, talk through a few things. And there's still some discussions about 
um, what the city may receive from the county or the state about some mitigation help uh, for cleaning, for outreach, for law enforcement or fire, emergency services, whatever it is. Um, I think those are still ongoing discussions. The, um, so they'll probably open that one up at the airport end. It's about 2300 West, uh, sort of the dead end of North Temple, uh, out right by the airport. Um, probably open up uh, by Jan early January, maybe the first week of January. And it'll be a 24 hour facility. So folks won't have to go there at night, sleep and then leave during the day and come downtown. They can stay there continuously, which is really a, a really positive benefit. Um, it helps them be more secure and stable. They'll have food on site, those kind of things. I think it helps the neighborhood too. So folks aren't just going up and down North Temple every day, hauling all their stuff and having to sort of survive that way. So from now until April, essentially those will be running. Uh, that one in Mill Creek and then um, the regular resource centers. And there's some ongoing talks about next year already. Um, I'm not going to say anything about that. I'm, I'm going to be cautiously optimistic right now that we'll be able to find a more dispersed model. Uh, the other thing that happened was the fleet block has been a big discussion recently with the council. Uh, there is a petition to rezone it to a new zoning um, form base three, which was called. It was pretty flexible zoning. Um, a lot of concern from a lot of members in the community about what would happen to the murals there if that were to to happen. Um, so what we've done essentially is delay that vote until January, and. Um, have it have any zoning discussion be contingent on well have any zoning discussion be contingent on a community engagement process to talk through what will happen there so that you don't just pass the zoning without with kind of a blank check and then you figure that out as you go we need those sort of simultaneous so uh, that's how that's going to move forward if you um, are wondering about the fleet block at this point i still have strong opinions that i think we need more public space there than private um, there's also some discussion about um, if we can do a full park there and a full park at the water park in, on 17th South. Um, I don't think it should be an either or, uh, but we'll have to keep getting into those uh, details with the administration and everyone. Uh, I saw a question in the chats real quick. Um, yeah, so uh, the question is if guests can stay in the same room the whole time during the winter time. Yeah, that's part of the benefit of using the motel. Um, it saves on cleaning costs every night. You don't have to redo everything every night. And for the guests, they can keep their stuff there. I mean, it's a private space. It's a huge benefit. Plus, they have their own bathroom. So from a covert perspective, it makes total sense. From a privacy perspective, it makes total sense. Just a general health perspective. And it's cheaper. So I think it's a good idea overall if we can do that sort of model. The best idea is to get housing. And that's going to be another discussion with the legislature. But we'll see. Uh, it's otherwise, um, I've been vice chair this year and my uh, time is ending in that role. Um, and we'll do new elections come January uh, for leadership and the council. Um, the other thing that will be coming up for you all to be aware of is James Rogers has been serving from the city on the Inland Port Board. Um, the state legislates, the legislation said it should be a city representative. Um, but it didn't delineate um, who from the council of the city should be it from the council. Uh, from the council perspective, we felt that districts one and two were most heavily impacted and therefore one of us should be the representative on that board. Um, from mine, uh, James is probably not running again um, after his term ends next year. And so uh, we're discussing right now about how we move that. It's going to be either me or them. I think I'm, as much as I don't want to be on that board, folks, I'll be honest with you all. Um, I think it's important for us to be represented there. So I'm going to be uh, working on taking over that for the next two years after James is done. Um, but that's still a discussion we're going to have to have at the council level. So, Thanks, Andrew. Uh, anyone have questions for Andrew? Yeah. Thank you. Um, I, what I'd like to do is move on to our next agenda item, uh, which is regarding a development proposal. It's pretty far out west in the neighborhood, though, although it's still considered Glendale. Uh, we had some questions about it. We had a board member, um, Ashley King, has been looking into it. Uh, her and Cody suggested that we have 
Brian come and uh, just talk through the proposal, answer any questions, um, and then Sarah is also here from the city. Um, and I believe you're the, are you the project manager, Sarah, or? Right, I'm the, pro I'm the planner working on the project, and then Brian is the Colin user, and he's here now. Okay. Um, and then for what it's worth, um, I can go ahead and share my screen um, and just kind of show you where the project is at. And then um, Brian, if you want, I can pull up anything that um, you've submitted to. That's great. And I just gave you the ability to share, Sarah. Okay. Um, is that working for you all? It, yes. Okay, so are you seeing the map? Uh, yes. Okay, good, just checking. Um, so, um, you know, here's 201, kind of right here. Is my cursor lining up too? Yes. Um, and then this is 5600 West, and so it'd be in this part of the parcel. And then um, I'll just go ahead and, and turn it over to Brian at this point. Brian, are you, are you there and unmuted? There we, there we go. Now, can you guys, can everybody hear me? Yes. Okay, perfect. Yeah, so I represent AT&T. Um, they're proposing an 80-foot monopole at, uh, I'm assuming that they, you guys can all see uh, uh, Sarah's, Sarah's screen. Um, so there'll be an 80-foot monopole. Um, it will be co-locatable. So hopefully if any other carriers in the area do need to have service in the area, um, There'll just be that one pole in the area. Not only will this tower serve AT&T customers, but it's also part of the nationwide first net, first responder network, which if I assume uh, Salt Lake is enrolled in that, it, it is free to all the jurisdictions. Um, I don't handle that, but uh, if you've heard about it, if you have any questions on that, I can answer that. Basically, it's, it's a dedicated line. Say there's you know, we have, I'm in Provo, so you know we have earthquake, earthquakes on Swan. Say there was a bad one in a, or some sort of catastrophic uh, incident. What happens is us as customers, we shut down all of the service, right? Well, that also would include shutting down all the services for first responders that need to help us. So the FirstNet uh, dedicated uh, spectrum will let all the customers will not have service, but the FirstNet will have their own spectrum so that all the first responders will be able to communicate with each other in an event of some sort of catastrophic or an emergency for that matter. Um, the ground footprint besides 80 foot monopole takes about a 50 by 50 foot um, area on the bottom. And that's just where they put their, uh, you know, where the carriers put their equipment on the bottom. And that's pretty much it. I would assume everybody's probably pretty familiar with seeing cell towers around. Yeah. Okay. Um, my, my only question is, is this covered, uh, and this may be a better question for Sarah, but will this be, I can't remember what they call them, but the stealth towers, I think, where they, they look different or? No, it's a standard tower. Um, this is generally what it would look like. Um, most of these are um, go to an administrative hearing or a planning commission hearing, but we do require planning commission hearings for um, towers that are in the inland port. This is within the inland port boundaries. Okay. Um, does anyone have any questions? Yeah, I have a few questions. I was interested to know if there were, I guess, any other feasible locations that were considered in or is this the only one uh like location you guys had picked and are, are there any anticipated negative effects to the environment and if so like any in mitigation efforts sure I'll, I'll go first here you can probably help on the second one but um you know all of the sites are dictated by an rf engineer so there were other sites that were uh, you know, looked at, but to provide the best coverage overall, um, there weren't many choices really in the area. So this was pretty much it. Um, second, as far as any environmental issues, there 
there wouldn't be any environment issues on our side. It's already gone through some of the comments of the of sheriff's department and the planning. And um, I do have a couple other things. There's a drain issue I have to deal with right now. And then there's also um, the uh, working with uh, David at the airport to uh, mitigate any kind of uh, elevation issues that he may have. And it looks like I'll have to get an easement for that just to make sure our heights. I believe it's just so the heights can be, you know, they're not too high uh, interfering with the airport. That's correct. And then we do look at all of those things as part of the conditional use process and evaluate that. And um, this particular antenna was actually um, approved last year in the conditional use process, but they approved it by it. Um, and so it's coming back again and going to the planning commission. Um, and it's expected to go in January and uh, this is about that out. So. Is any lighting intended to be installed on the site? Um, I didn't hear that. Was any what to be lighting. installed? Oh, lighting. Lighting and so there's no lighting. Um, lighting isn't needed if it's under a certain height, which right now is at 199 feet. If you hit 200, you have to have mandatory lighting per FCC regulation. So at 80 feet, uh, there is no need for lighting. Okay. But I can say one thing, I will say one thing, if, if David from the airport comes back and says it needs lighting, no problem, we put lighting on it. Would that need to be directional for their purposes for aviation visibility? Yeah, that would be, yeah, so you've, yeah, that's, he would be part of like the FAA portion. Um, so if they, if they deem it necessary due to flights, uh, no problem, at and puts, puts the light on there. Yeah. But they would only put it on there if it's you know deemed absolutely necessary by a jurisdictional um, decision. Well, thank you, Brian, for your time tonight. Thank you too, Sarah. Uh, Sorry, I got you... one more. Oh, okay, go ahead. Sorry. Um, I guess it just seemed like it was located since it is located to like the refuge. I wondered, is that a concern with like? birds hitting the pole. I don't know a lot about that, but it seems like just since it was next to a wildlife in refuge, was there any consideration for that or something? Sarah, I might let you answer that, but I haven't heard that before, you know, as far as from after we submit the application. I'm not sure a wildlife person has looked at that. I mean, I don't know if there's like a flyway the only, honestly, the only thing I've ever heard of was like when they have wildlife with the windmills, not for just a stationary. They usually have a problem with actually the birds nesting on the on the structures more than you know flying into a stationary uh, monopole like this would be. It wasn't something. I mean, it's something that's looked at in the conditional use criteria, but it wasn't an issue that we highlighted as part of this proposal. Um, it's also going to be next to the Mountain View corridor. Um, which if you can, if you look on, I guess you can't see the aerial anymore, but when you look on the aerial, it's going to be directly to the west side. That would um, likely mitigate some of the impact. What, what would it take to make it look like a monopole? I'm sorry, I, there's some feedback. Uh, yeah, what would it take for them to make it look, not look like a monopole? Not that I love fake trees, but marginally better than a monopole. Brian, is that something you could answer? Well, yeah, so that's, that's always a tough one, right? Because then you have to figure out design, what's in the area. You know, if we're building something in the mountains, per se, you, you would do more of like trees. This is an industrial area, so I'm not really sure what sort of uh, stealthing. And, and we really, not to put it back on you, Sarah, but you know, we, we really look back onto the planning department to tell us if that's one of their requirements. At, at this time, I haven't been aware that uh, stealthing is a requirement for how that property is listed or zoned. Um, so I believe a monopole is acceptable in that area and it doesn't have to be stealth. No, I, I understand that it's not required and there's a lot of reasons why that, but to give you some background on this neighborhood, um, we had a pole go in 
legally go in that clearly was not done properly was the wrong pole height wrong array size and frankly was lied to by the city um, so there's a history of not trusting the utilities to put in poles that they look for um, so I wasn't you I'm not saying that you did that but I'm saying that just because it's legal I think it might be a good idea to look at how you go a little bit beyond So, I, and and Sarah can correct me too. I, I didn't do the previous one, so I I'm not aware of anything like that. As Sarah can say, I just I kind of came in late on this um, to take over. But any suggestions are made during the planning commission, or I don't know how this um, you know hearing does go into Sarah's report. But normally the jurisdiction would give this report. There'd be the suggestions. They would come back to me, and then I would report back to AT and T. Um, if there is some sort of stealthing design that you're thinking, of course, me, I'm just the messenger, right? So I'm all ears. You could certainly, I mean, I, I really don't know what you'd even put in that area to even make it fit in without it being bigger, right? Because if you're, if you're stealthing, you're stealthing the antennas and those things all have a 10 foot face. So you got to go, are you following what I'm saying? Like, I really not sure what structure that you could put there that would work. I'm sorry, I'm being creative. To make it look. <laughs> uh, as you take it back to your folks, I would say be creative. I would say, from what I've learned in the last five years in the city council, it's not one provider that follows city rules. And I think there's some good things that could be had by going a little bit above and beyond in this sense. Um, and I'll say that with all kindness to you, because I know it's not you and you're walking into this. Um, but this is not a one off deal. Um, we have polls across the city that are not legal and it's flawed city ordinances and it's created a lot of distrust and ill will towards, I'll just say for me personally. Um, cell service is important, all the things you brought up are important, but I think it can be done in a way that respects the community as much as possible. And I know it's industrial area, look a monopole is not great, but there's also a bird refuge to the west of it and to the north. So. Sometimes I do a lot of stuff like the BLM and the Forest Service, and sometimes in these, I'm just throwing it out there too. Sometimes the the recommendation is if a stealth structure maybe wouldn't look the best even there. Not that a monopole looks better, because I, I agree. Trust me, I agree. But sometimes we've come to um, a painting of not just the pole, but a painting of the pole and the antennas. And I've been in a lot of hearings. I've been doing this for a long time, and you probably don't get two people. <laughs> That'll agree on that. Well, some people want it brown. Some people want it the color of the sky. But sometimes a, a painting of the monopole actually does help it look less obtrusive to the, uh, you know, for a visual effect. I don't know if that's a possibility or. I recommend be creative. I understand it's hard. Thanks, Turner. So what we would have. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, and I appreciate, I appreciate the comments too. And then. You know, maybe Sarah, you and I can visit about this tomorrow and, and uh, kind of come up with something. I mean, we already have a design, you know, with the monopole in there, which, you know, if, you, if I'd have to just, we'd have to talk about it and then just see. We can talk about it. Um, and I, I, I know what you're referring to, um, Councillor Johnston, as far as cell antennas in the area. I, I don't know too much about that, that project, though, but I understand your concerns and where you're coming from. Thank you. Um, in the interest of time, unless there's any other questions, I'm going to move on to the next item on our agenda. Thank you, Brian, and thank you, Sarah, for joining. I know it's after hours and it's right before the holidays, but we appreciate it. Yep, no problem. Thanks for the opportunity. Thank you. Thanks. Um, so the next thing that I'd like to move on to, um, I saw that Josh from the mayor's office had joined, and I want to see if Josh would like to give us an update. Yes, thank you. Good evening, everyone. And happy holidays. Um, apologies, I won't be able to turn on my camera. I'm on a desktop that doesn't have a camera. Um, so I don't have too much uh, to share this evening. <clears throat> Just a reminder of um, what you can access online on the city website. We, as you uh, may have heard, there's a winter storm coming in overnight and perhaps uh, throughout the day tomorrow. Just so you're aware, um, on the city website, you can track the city snow plows and view the uh, snow removal 
priority map, and that can be at, uh, viewed at slc.gov slash mystreet. And uh, so that available, that information is available online. Also, in the mayor's office, the ACE fund application for the 2021 event year is open. And uh, ACE stands for Arts, Culture, and Events. And uh, this consists of funds ranging from, uh, thanks Turner for putting that link there, funds ranging from $100 to $10,000 for both large and small events in the community um, taking place in the next year. Um, of course, this, many events are gonna look different. So this year is a lot different for ACE, but uh, the funding uh, applications open until January 8th. And I'm gonna copy and paste the link to that in the chat. And I'm sure Turner is well, Turner was well aware of this and uh, just wanted to share that with you all. Also this Saturday morning or in the morning and afternoon, there will be a warm clothing drive at the city and county building uh, between the city and, and Volunteers of America. Uh, VOA will be having a warm clothing drive on the horseshoe, the uh, front of the city and county building from 11 a.m. to 3 p.m. If you have any warm clothing to donate uh, for adults, that would be much appreciated. And uh, that's an opportunity to donate there. So that is all I have formally to share. Uh, does anyone have any questions regarding what I talked about or anything else? Doesn't look like it. Thank you, Josh. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to move on to the next item on the agenda. Um, the next item that we had prepared tonight uh, in January at our January meeting, we'll be having annual elections for our secretary and our treasurer's positions. Uh, both of them are up and they're a two year term. They're elected on a different cycle than our chair and our two vice chairs are elected. Um, Given that we're online and we haven't conducted an election online before, we wanted to be transparent about the way that we're going to do it. Um, for those that are watching live on Facebook, what I want to encourage you to do before the next meeting is to RSVP so that you can participate in the Zoom meeting. Um, we had to kind of adapt because of COVID and we recognize that there's not a perfect way of doing things and that doing things online does leave folks out. Um, but we want to be as inclusive as possible. At our January meeting, we will conduct the election via Zoom, which I will show you uh, really quickly. So I'm gonna put up just a fake election really, really quickly. Um, so you can see what it will look like in January. And I, I just have to do it really quickly. At the January meeting, we will have um, the, uh, another person who's running the election separate and distinct from me, since I'll be chairing the meeting, we'll have someone else who's actually running the election. Uh, but wanted to give you just a quick uh, demo of what the election will look like. So you all should receive a poll or a notification that a poll has opened. And then what you all will be able to do using Zoom is to vote in that election. Um, so what we'll do is we'll put the names of all the candidates who are nominated or who self-nominate, and then we'll conduct the vote electronically, and folks will be able to see uh, the results of that poll in real time. Um, obviously, there, this is a new process and something we haven't done before, uh, but we want to make sure that we have a full slate of officers for our next meeting. Um, I would also add that there is a mechanism for folks uh, to be elected as an at-large board member and participate in one of our committees. And I'll, I'll get into some of the committees that we have going on right now, but uh, we really want to have good representation from our neighborhood, having folks who speak Spanish and are connected to the different communities within our neighborhood is a priority. So uh, the, the last thing that I'd like to say on the subject of elections is, even if you've never held a position on a community council, we, we're here to support you. I know that every board member would help with training and mentorship and, and really to help people grow into a leadership role. It's something we are all deeply connected to and committed to. Uh, so please uh, get involved and we'd love to have you involved in the community council. 
Um, as far as the election goes, as soon as, oh, so the poll just launched, so you should see that poll. Um, and if you all would just take a second to vote really quickly, I will show you how the process will work. Um, so then we'll end the poll and we'll have transparency right there in the results of the election. So you all should now be seeing the poll results. So, uh, okay. So that's how we'll conduct the election in January. Uh, are there any questions, anything I can answer? We will be putting out information in the next, uh, probably after Christmas um, or after New Year's, just so it doesn't get lost in the mix, but we'll put out position descriptions for the secretary and treasurer in English and Spanish. We'll also probably do a nomination form in advance uh, just to, to give folks an opportunity to get their name on the list and so we can run a, a smooth election and, and be as inclusive as possible at the January meeting. Uh, I'm happy, if there's any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Okay. Um, so it looks like, it doesn't look like there's any. I'm gonna move on to the next item on the agenda, which is kind of uh, the, the gist of what we wanted to get to tonight. I, we've had a lot of conversations through the year about different projects and different things that the community council was working on. And I just wanted to report back on what we've been doing for the past year and give you all uh, an understanding of some of the work that we're doing. And uh, I apologize if I'm looking away from you as I'm talking, I have two screens. Uh, and my notes are up here. So the, the first thing that I'd like to do, um, and Brandon, if you're okay, uh, if you wouldn't mind giving just an update on the One Glendale Plan and kind of what you and Lily have been working on, um, that'd be great. Sure, yeah. So uh, Lily and I have spent um, the last couple of months doing uh, interviews with people in the community, uh, and that um, we've also done some stuff like the uh, the cleanup events for the Jordan River, as well as um, there was a neighborhood uh, trash pickup day ba uh, back in, I think, October. Um, and so we, we helped out with that, and we've been trying to just get um, basically some initial data collected for, um, you know, to kind of help us inform our survey. And we've compiled a community survey that we hope to send out in January that'll be um, probably our widest reaching um, engagement activity. Uh, we've got the first draft of the survey out there um, to some of the like stakeholders who are going to help us um, kind of work through it and um, get a final draft ready to send out in January. It'll be available in uh, at least English and Spanish at this point, um, possibly one other language as well. Um, and then from there we will hopefully be able to put together some sort of uh, some sort of document. I think that should cover everything, Turner. Thanks, Brandon. Um, and for those that are watching that are unfamiliar with what we're talking about, Brandon and Lily are students at the University of Utah in the planning department, and they've been working with us. Uh, we've been basically working on creating a strategic plan for the community council. So instead of getting into specific issues, for example, uh, calling for a crosswalk at any particular street. What we've been doing is reaching out to neighbors and having conversations about general broad themes. Um, so when the document comes out, the goal is that uh, whoever the officers are of the community council will have engaged our neighbors in a way that we have some broad themes of agreement that neighbors want to see. And an example of one of those uh, is just overwhelmingly, as we've had this conversation, people have have mentioned the importance of parks in our neighborhood and wanting to see more activation at, Mis uh, at Modesto Park and Bend in the River. And so what we'll do is we'll take these general themes that come out and then the community council board over the next couple of years can create action items and proposals for the community to consider for how we can enact some of these goals and, and move forward together. Uh, and Lily and Brandon, have been interviewing people one-on-one. -on -one. We're gonna do a bunch of surveys. Um, we want to make sure that everyone is included in this process. And so you'll see those surveys start to come out, or I should say survey, come out in January. It's a little bit longer. I think it, last time I looked, it was about 40 questions and there's quite a bit of open-ended questions. And what we're trying to get to, like I said, is those common themes. 
Um, so another theme that's that's emerged is just the general desire for safer streets in terms of pedestrian access and kids being able to walk to school and those types of things. So we will take all the feedback we've gotten in the one-on-ones, in these meetings, in the emails that are sent to council members, um, and then in the survey data, and we'll come back with a document that we'll talk about for several months before we put it to you all to vote on as kind of a strategic plan for the, the community council. Uh, and I've put Lily and Brandon's contact information in the chat, both on Zoom and on Facebook. So if you would like to be involved in the process, if you have ideas or concerns, please get in touch with them um, and we can make sure that they're included. Um, any questions from those here on Zoom or on Facebook? Cool. Um, thank you, Brandon. Thanks for being here. Uh, the next item that I wanted to update everyone on I believe it was at our September or our October meeting, uh, community council member uh, Dane Hess actually mentioned the Buy Nothing movement and that there's not currently a group here in Glendale for the, the Buy Nothing uh, movement. There's one that's been very successful in Rose Park. And be, because of the rules of Buy Nothing, uh, the national organization, they're very geographically tailored to neighborhoods to really promote neighborly connection and so if you live in Glendale, but you wanted to join Rose Parks, you wouldn't be able to. Uh, so we, uh, over the last couple of months, we've looked at this idea, we've been exploring it. Um, we're gonna come back to everyone in January with a formal proposal, but at this time we are moving forward with creating a Buy Nothing group here in Glendale. Uh, if this is something you're really interested in, there are, is some training required and we will need to have moderators to help run the page. So if that's something, if you're active on Facebook and next door, if that's something you're interested in, please get in touch with us uh, because we'll be joining or creating our own group uh, here in Glendale for Buy Nothing. Uh, the next thing, uh, if it's okay with you all, I'm just gonna run through this because these are short bullet points and then I'm happy to answer question on any item as we get moving forward. Uh, the next thing, we have another intern named Damien uh, and he has been working with me on Keep Glendale Beautiful. So for the last year, we've been going through the chartering process and the affiliation process with Keep America Beautiful. Um, by becoming an affiliate, we receive access to grants, just national support, they mail us t-shirts, they provide a variety of resources. Um, and by April of this coming year, we expect to be a fully recognized affiliate of Keep America Beautiful. It will be Keep Glendale Beautiful. Uh, and we will have uh, that whole process wrapped up and then a little bit more structure in terms of neighborhood cleanups and graffiti, graffiti control. Um, so we'll be bringing a lot of fun and exciting things uh, to the neighborhood and then the opportunity for grant funding uh, to support that type of thing. Uh, the next thing is the urban forestry subcommittee that was brought up in Nove at November's meeting. Uh, Salt Lake City, uh, the, the D Urban Forestry Division has put out information saying that they're working with community councils to set up urban forestry committees to take care of the trees uh, that, are, that are planted in public spaces um, and along the Jordan River to have neighbors volunteer to help care for some of these trees and make sure that they get watered and that they're taken care of. Uh, we're looking at the logistics of that and it, it what we're trying to determine if it, is if it makes sense to have it be part of Keep Glendale Beautiful since there's already beautification there. Um, but again, we'll come back in January with a little bit of a formal proposal for how we plan to, to do that and make it sustainable. Um, the, the next thing that we've talked about repeatedly over the last couple of months is that the community council meetings are kind of difficult to have longer conversations at. Um, you all probably noticed that I try to move the agenda along pretty quickly, and that's not to silence anyone or to reduce feedback. It's just the, the nature of how many things we have on the agenda. So what we're planning to do in the new year is to host longer conversations about a specific topic. So it looks like our first one is going to be on the subject of crime and public safety here in the neighborhood. And basically the structure we're settling on is probably a 15 minute presentation from either our uh, uh, community detective 
or maybe the police chief or, or some, an officer in public safety to have a conversation about crime statistics and trends and then have a longer conversation as neighbors about ways that we can be involved, about just, just uh, an opportunity to have a longer conversation about specific topics. And we have about six different topics that are in the queue, crime and public safety. Uh, I'd like to invite some folks to represent homeless service providers or, or providers of services for our unsheltered uh, neighbors um, and, and just have some longer conversations. I think one of the things that's hard to do in the community council meetings is to provide enough background on issues so that folks can kind of see that 10,000 foot view, if you will. Um, and, and we wanna just be able to have the, those conversations in a forum where we have enough time to do them justice. Um, and then the, the last thing is, I, I just wanna go back to the elections that I had mentioned earlier. I, I think it's very, very important that we make our community council more representative. And so if you have neighbors who've talked to you about issues in the past, if you have neighbors that have expressed interest in what's going on in the, the neighborhood, please uh, encourage them to get involved in the community council uh, and join us. Like I said earlier, we will, we will mentor, we will train, we'll provide support, uh, anything we can do to make sure that, that our neighbors have a voice in our, our process. Um, Amy, as far as your question, Amy asked uh, where we'll announce the in-depth conversations. Uh, we'll announce them in our email newsletter. We put them out on Facebook. Uh, and then I, I just try to email uh, folks that I know that live here and, and we'll get them out on social media and uh, announce them as much as possible. So, and they'll be hosted. Uh, I saw that Heather asked on the chat on Facebook why we aren't having our in-person meetings in the library. Uh, and it's because the libraries are all closed right now due to COVID and we won't go back to in-person meetings until we receive uh, the all clear. So my, my kind of takeaway for everyone is when the vaccine is widely available, please be sure to get the vaccine because that is how we get back to normal, back to in-person events, doing community events. Um, I, I think Zoom has been good in a number of ways but I don't like conducting business and all of our meetings here uh, in, a, in a digital space because I think folks are left out of this. So uh, our goal is to get back to in-person as soon as it's safe uh, to do so and as soon as public health guidelines will let us do that. Uh, with that, I'm happy to answer any questions on what we've got going on, processes, and take suggestions for things we should do in 2021. Let me just double check out the chat. Hello, this is Ray, Ray Wheeler. Um, I just want to check in with you guys and see if the recommendations we discussed about a Black Sky community endorsement of the Black Sky protocols, uh, or Dark Sky, excuse me, uh, will be eventually on the, the agenda. I, if we, these things fly by and we, if we don't take a vote on, on the occasion that they're discussed, they can easily fall through the cracks. So I hope we will uh, put it on the agenda for eventually and get it resolved. Yeah, uh, yes, Ray, I'm so glad you mentioned that. I just noticed on my list that I skipped <laughs> over that. Um, that is one other proposal that we're working on. At our last uh, council board meeting, we had the students and the instructor that presented at our last council meeting come and talk through some ideas with us. Uh, right. And that's something that we plan to include in both the one Glendale plan and to come back with a formal proposal on in January. We have a good start on some ideas for how we can do it. Um, what we're also looking at doing is um, potentially having the community council I, uh, map all of our parks and the Jordan River Parkway to identify areas where lights could be replaced and then actually create uh, working with maybe Rocky Mountain Power or one of these other organizations that has grant funding to actually buy and replace some of the lights here. So I, I think especially in our shared spaces along the river and in our parks are some areas where we can make some impact directly as a community. Great. It would, you know, that's a good idea to have an inventory of overlit 
areas, potentially, uh, the best people to do that would be the students or faculty uh, who brought this issue to us and or our own planning consultants from the university. Uh, but it would to make it that specific would be actually, I think, very helpful. Uh, that doesn't happen overnight. We don't have someone to do it at the moment. But it could be just a design charrette where people throw out ideas. I, there was a time when the lights in the little Jordan Park or Night South Park were so bright. I swear you could open a New York Times and sit there in the middle of the night on a park bench under those lights and read, read it without eye strain. Um, that's, I think the lights along the Jordan Parkway, which are kind of my backyard, have been recently replaced. It seems to me there's more of them now. They look different. They're two instead of one. Uh, and that is probably what it is. I mean, we're not going to go change that now. Although it may be that different light bulbs in the fixtures could be imagined. They but got brighter, a, I think, actually. Sorry. Yeah, I think they did. Well, partly because they were doubled up. Um, and many people, you know, this could be controversial. Many people are frightened by the prospect of less light on the Parkway Trail and elsewhere. Uh, so it could be a lengthy discussion and that's fine, but I just didn't want it to fall through. So thank you, Turner, for keeping that uh, percolating and let's see if we can find somebody to give us some advice. Thank you. And what will, as far as next steps, what we're looking at doing is uh, most likely a, a resolution of some kind that we'll vote on as a community, followed by uh, maybe a committee or, or looking at doing, I think it would even be fun as a neighborhood to bring neighbors together to go out and do that inventory and teach people about Dark Sky yeah. as we do do the, the inventory. That is the best way to do it. Get people together, look at one situation, typical lighting that we have, and discuss it, in, and also have an expert there with us who would make recommendations on the spot so we can understand what it really means. That would be very helpful. I love that idea. Thank you. Uh, anyone else? All right. Well, I, I, we don't have anything else on the agenda unless anyone has final business or questions. Uh, I did just see one come in on Facebook. Uh, Kaylee asked if we've reached out to Tracy Aviary regarding the Dark Sky Initiative. We haven't directly, but the program of students that we've been working with at the university, the Tracy Aviary is one of their community partners. And so that was one of the things that they mentioned when they came to our board meeting is that they could help us connect with other agencies and groups that are working on this and provide us some recommendations on that. Um, with that, I think we're out of questions unless anyone has any final ones. Uh, I think we'll go ahead and adjourn the meeting. Actually, I have, I have a trivial question and that is, remind me, do you send something out by email to notify people about the meetings, the community council meetings and with the agenda? We do, uh, we've been without a secretary. Jeremy's been doing minutes and, and all of that. Uh, this month it slipped through the cracks, but hopefully when we have a full board, mm -hmm. uh, that can be the secretary's responsibility because some, some months it doesn't happen. I have right, not aren't much. Aren't you on the uh, email Go list? Ahead. Go ahead, sorry. Aren't you on the email list? Uh, I would like to get on that list just so I get a reminder and can quickly check the agenda. Frankly, I don't have the time to sit in, through many of these meetings and I tend to come when something that I'm interested in is there. So I, I just would appreciate a heads up. And I know it's hard to get those all out. I, I think in the past you may have used what's the uh, neighborhood news network uh, as a posting next area. Door, yeah, it's notified on next door as well sometimes. Yeah, I could look on Facebook actually. Uh, we list both our meetings on Facebook and next door. And yeah, then next door, right. We use MailChimp to also send out the newsletter. Um, okay. That, this is another topic that I would love to just have everyone take away and think about over the holidays. Mm -hmm. 
how we can do a better job communicating about meetings. Um, and, and right now it, it's a little bit of a capacity issue, but when we have a full board, that's something I think that's very, very important. And uh, for me, another priority is making sure that we're having meetings in Spanish. Um, so that's something we're looking at. I, I've been communicating with folks. Uh, what we're looking at doing is in January, having our regular community council meeting fully in English, followed by maybe a special meeting afterward in Spanish, or the, the thing we don't, that I'm very cognizant of is I don't wanna give um, the impression that we're creating separate but equal. The, the main problem is with translation happening live on Zoom, it, it, gets, it, it can be very difficult to do it online. When we're in person, it's much easier to have translation and, and to mm -hmm. do that. But I've just found that Zoom is very mm -hmm. difficult to make those kind of accommodations. So mm -hmm. uh, when we're back in person, it's an easy problem to solve. Uh, when we're here on Zoom, it's a little bit more difficult, but it is something that's in front of mind. Hey, hey Turner, I don't know about this, but are there any um, programs, algorithms that somehow just do subtitles as we all speak, and even though that would be mistake-ridden potentially, but is that a possibility? It's something I just asked for a recommendation oh. for. Oh, uh, great, cool. I'm hoping uh, one of the folks that we talked to about interpretation recommended a few software. Oh, great. And so I'm gonna look at those, talk about pricing, and then work mm -hmm. with the board to see if we can't afford doing something like that. That would be awesome, because I'd hate to see separate meetings. That doesn't feel right somehow yeah and, and i agree it's it's the digital nature right now and i i'm concerned if we go six more months without anything that we, we right folks along right with. sure sure thank you for looking into that thank you um all right uh, are there any other last questions before we end All right, well, thank you all. Uh, have a safe and happy holiday, uh, and we will see you all in the new year. Thanks, everybody.